It's your Wednesday daily delivery. I'm Michael Rand. Glad to be back for another day. Hope you guys are having a great day out there as well. Lots to get to today. Uh, I don't say that lightly. Ben Gessling is my guest on today's show, Star Tribune Vikings writer. We will talk Vikings, kind of touching on the draft from a couple weeks ago, what the Vikings process will be with J.J. McCarthy, their first round quarterback drafted number 10 overall what they liked enough about Dallas Turner to move up to number 17 to get him, and kind of what to expect at rookie minicamp this weekend. We'll also get into the Kirk Cousins uh, situation in Atlanta with them drafting Michael Penix Jr. Um, ben obviously had a lot of thoughts about that, so plenty of Vikings stuff coming up on today's show. I uh, Got a little WNBA stuff, a little wild stuff at the end of the show. First, though, what did I miss Got to start NBA, of course, Timberwolves, Nuggets, kind of this little break in the series, three days off between those two games in Denver where the Wolves won both, could go up 2-0 in the series, and Friday night's game at Target Center where the Wolves can take even greater command of the series, or Denver, the defending champions, can get back into it if they can find a way to win that game. Um, biggest story from Tuesday, Rudy Gobert, who missed Monday's game for the birth of his son, um, named uh, NBA Defensive Player of the Year for the fourth time in his career. What a comeback for Rudy Gobert. I want to talk about this a little bit. What a comeback because he um, didn't get a single vote for all defensive team last year. Didn't get a single vote for Defensive Player of the Year. Not on the first team nor the second team. All NBA, uh, all defensive team a year ago. Got shut out of the voting completely a year ago. Had won three Defensive Player of the Year awards with Utah. So last year, of course, his first year with the Wolves, didn't his health wasn't what it wanted to be. You know, his back was acting up a lot of the year. The Wolves suffered as a result. They were 42 and 40. A lot of other factors with that, inclu including, of course, Carl Anthony Towns missing about two thirds of the season with that calf injury. But Gobert comes back this season, looks like a different player from the very beginning, plays like a different player from the very beginning, and now has won his fourth defensive player of the year award, completely changing the narrative on kind of where he's at in his career completely changing the narrative on the trade that sent all those draft picks to Utah, um, completely changing the narrative on the Timberwolves season and where they are right now, because obviously six playoff wins in a row now. They swept the Suns, up 2-0 on Denver, 80 points allowed in Game 2 against Denver, even though Rudy Gobert wasn't there. And a lot of people crediting Rudy Gobert with changing the defensive culture here, making sure that there is such attention paid to defense that even in a game when he's not there because of the birth of his child, when he's not there, that that standard of excellence still maintains. Now, obviously, he should be back for Game Three a couple days from now at uh, at Target Center. But just just the the way he played this year, anchoring what was almost the entire season the best defense in the NBA, um, anchoring the middle, the way he defended in Game One, taking away a lot of those lobs from uh, from Nikola Jokic to Aaron Gordon taking away you know all those things he does all the things that he does to impact the game defensively it's you know and that defense is not um it's not the kind of thing that always that always jumps out at you it did in game two uh that jumped out at you a lot of people talking about how the wolves played defense in game two it's not always the kind of thing where it makes the highlights right it's not a dunk it's not you know splash plays all the time unless it's a block or something like that but the wolves just play excellent team defense rotating, flying around to the ball, knowing their assignments. Gobert is a huge part of that and will be a huge part of it for them for the foreseeable future. So a, a, a well-earned award. He got over 70% of the first-place votes. Victor Wembanyama, um, rookie, excellent defensive player, obviously, for San Antonio. Probably going to win a lot of these awards in the future. He was second. Um, Bam Adebayo for the Heat and Anthony Davis with the Lakers got some first-place votes, too. But most of them going to go bear. A pretty easy win for him in this case. And we'll see if the Wolves can get a win against Denver in a couple of nights. Chris Hines should be a guest, by the way, on an upcoming show, probably tomorrow's show, kind of juggling some things around depending on what uh, what seems to fit best. But I think Chris Hine, he and I will certainly talk more about Rudy Gobert. I think on Thursday's show, Rudy Gobert is slated to talk to the media sometime Wednesday as well to kind of talk about that award, but also the birth of his son. 
Couple other NBA things of note. Jamal Murray fined a hundred thousand dollars for throwing a towel and a heat pack on the floor intentionally uh, during play. At least one of those was during play in uh, game two as he got frustrated sitting on the bench, frustrated, frustrated with the officiating, frustrated with the way the night was going. Find a hundred thousand dollars. That seemed to be like the most likely outcome. I didn't think he was going to, I didn't think he was going to get suspended. If the if the penalty, as they were talking about, if it, if they had caught it during the game, if the penalty was only going to be a technical foul and not an ejection, I'm not surprised that this is quote unquote only a hundred thousand dollar fine. But that's a, that's a pretty big, uh, pretty big trim to his uh, to his to his wallet. Although it's not, it's a drop in the bucket for a lot of these NBA players. But uh, find a hundred thousand dollars, and we'll see what kind of effort he has in Game Three, playing on that calf injury, playing you know a series where he's been. Very very frustrated so far. The other Western Conference uh, semifinal, by the way, Oklahoma cruised. Oklahoma City cruised over Dallas, one seventeen ninety five. That was the series opener in that game. Uh, Wolves already played twice. That one just starting, but I believe they play Thursday again, so that one will be two games by the time the Wolves uh, play their third against Denver. So Oklahoma City looking every bit like the number one seed, um, stifling Dallas, um, getting getting all after. Uh, Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving looking very much the part, even though they are a very young team. Boston also easily handling handling Cleveland one twenty to ninety five in that Eastern Conference semifinal series opener. Imagine that the I imagine the Dallas Oklahoma City series might get more competitive as the series goes on as Dallas figures some things out, but I don't think Cleveland's going to be much of a threat to Boston. Boston seems like they have a pretty clear path to the Eastern Conference Finals. Open a 5.15% annual percentage yield nine-month certificate from Royal Credit Union. Open now at rcu.org slash certificate 515. Early withdrawal penalties could reduce earnings and principal. APY accurate as of 4 24 Insured by NCUA. Let's talk Vikings today on Daily Delivery. It's all anybody's talking about, right? Right now, Ben? <laughs> yes. Ben Gessling? Yeah, it's a, it's a rare turn for the Vikings, not at the t- top of the sports uh, mountaintop in the Twin Cities, but you know it, if if people are still interested in the tiny team in Egan, I'm happy to provide what I know about them. <laughs> Even you were tweeting about the Wolves on yeah. Monday night. You were like, "What? What did you say? Like this feels like a, a dream, or feels like a, I can't remember what Out you said." Body experience. Out of body experience. Yeah. How, yeah. We just don't see Minnesota teams do this very much, do we? No. No. Just the thing of I mean, the the, the part that felt so surreal about it was a team that goes in with that. That level of, we don't care. That level of assertiveness. We don't care you're the defending champs. We don't care that we don't have our center. Uh, we are going to go in and just take it to you from the jump. It, you know, and things not going wrong. I mean, everybody's kind of waiting right. for the banana in the tailpipe. So, right. yeah, to see that kind of thing, it just doesn't happen. Hasn't happened um, very much. I, I went to watch that game Um at a restaurant in our neighborhood with a couple of buddies and I'm walking home. It's like 60 degree night and the basketball team is just blown out the defending champs and the weather is perfect. It's like, what existence is this? <laughs> we and feel- it just does not feel like a Minnesota <laughs> thing to have happened. It felt so, good. It felt good. Yeah, we were it was, not used it was to that. strange, and, but yeah, interesting. Kind and a of, lot of the, a lot of, of the, Min- a lot of the Minnesota sports scars that we have been are, Vikings related, so let's talk yeah. about let's talk about that team. The draft um, was a couple weeks ago now feels like it. You know, I think Quasi took a little bit of hits from some segments of the population who don't like giving up. You know, second, third, fourth, you yeah. know, however, however much draft capital they eventually needed to do the moves up to, especially to seventeen when you kind of looked at it on on balance. But the two guys they got, JJ McCarthy at ten. Uh, Dallas Turner at 17. You, in terms of need, in terms of relative value, in terms of taking big swings, and in terms of how much they eventually had to give up, it, it just didn't feel like it could. It didn't feel like it could have gone a whole lot better from what we knew going in. Yeah, I think the thing that everybody thought going in, myself included, was they are going to have to move up a lot to get the quarterback, and that was the, certainly the case with Drake May, and they tried. And they weren't able to do it because the Patriots didn't want to move off of that pick. But, you know, the thought process was, okay, well, if it's not 
May at three, it's going to have to be McCarthy at four or five. Right. Have to get in front of the Giants. Now, the Giants, as it turns out, that was a smokescreen. They weren't going after a quarterback there. Um, and they don't take one at number six. And then J.J. McCarthy keeps falling through the, the rest of the top ten. Not entirely because another team did not take a quarterback. Right. We can talk about that this in a minute. The surprise yeah. of the Knights was the Falcons, obviously. Yes. But the fact that McCarthy fell to the point where they only said, we need to move up one spot and just make sure yeah. we get him. And you see all the clips. I mean, the Jets saying, hey, this is free money. Um, Sean Payton trying to take credit yeah. for something yeah, somehow. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. I mean, I guess they probably figured, let's not take any chances. Let's not screw around. Let's just go up and yeah. get our guy. You know, it, the, the relative price they gave up was much less than... I thought they would have had to do to get a quarterback. And then that allowed them to say, let's keep 23 and we move up from there to get Dallas Turner. And, you know, a guy that I think a lot of people would have thought there's no way they're getting him right at 17. But when that first round breaks the way it does with its, you know, the record number, I think it was 14. Yeah. Uh, offensive players, in offensive a row. players yeah. off the top. It made it so that, you could kind of have both worlds. It, it was always a draft where if you didn't need a quarterback or you didn't need an offensive player, if, if your target was we needed a good defender, you were probably going to benefit from the fact that everybody else was looking for something different. So what the Vikings did, I I think if it works, is going to be worth looking back on is that as soon as they got the quarterback, they stopped being that team because they have everything else kind of taken care of on offense. So their approach was, all right, we now can think like one of these teams that is looking for a defensive player that can benefit from this run on offensive players. So let's get ahead of the big defensive position run, so to speak. Let's move back up and get a guy that a lot of people thought would be gone by that point. So I think the the aggressiveness, yes, they spent a lot, but we've seen the opposite of this around here for a long time where it's let's keep more picks because they're all the same and they're all lottery tickets. So let's just have more lottery tickets, which I, I think was always a flawed approach to it in the sense that there are not all draft picks are created equal. No. And if it's, we have more swings at players who are going to be impactful at the top of the draft, it was expensive to do it. But if both of these guys hit, nobody's going to be that concerned with that no. in a couple of years. You know. I want to revisit McCarthy and Turner in a minute. I want to pick your brain. As, now we've had a couple of weeks to digest it and think about it. How do you think the Falcons, Kirk Cousins, Michael Penix, how do you how did this happen? How do you think Kirk feels right now, thinking that he kind of got out of this whole idea no. of, hey, you're replaceable in a year or two, only to go to Atlanta, sign a huge contract, and then have him draft a 24-year-old, he's 24 now, 24-year-old rookie um, who, by all accounts, will be Cousins' replacement in two years? Well, I think the, I think Cousins was stunned. I think his camp was stunned. And I think, you know, for good reason. It sounds like they did not find out about the pick until there was about three minutes left on the clock. I think the wild. Falcons called around there to say, hey, we're taking a quarterback, which... Yeah, it, I think the, the thing that's so striking about it is the Vikings, in all of their discussions with Kirk Cousins, I mean, they've said this, I've heard this from his camp as well, they were pretty clear, we are going to draft a quarterback, and we want to have Kirk back here, we also have to think about the future. There was a lot of transparency to the point where, when you get to that Monday that he's going to go sign elsewhere, I think they sort of knew he's not going to be back here for what we're offering, because... He wants something with more security. And and they have been consistent in that regard when their offers have been kind of tepid for him for a long time. It was that way last year. It was that way really in 2022 where they give him a one-year extension and don't really make the commitment to him. Um, they have kind of broadcast for a while to him that we are keeping this door open. And then he says, okay, well, I'm going to go to another team that will commit to me. And the way that they wrote that contract, the contract the Falcons agreed to, gave a lot of financial signals that they were making that commitment. I mean, they gave him two full guaranteed years. And the third year is not officially fully guaranteed at this point, but on a practical level, 
the only way it's not is if they get rid of him next year because he has a big uh, roster bonus in 2026 that becomes fully guaranteed next spring in 2025. Yeah. So, I mean, we, I think, looked at this at the time, but it had like, it was like an anthology of the Mike McCartney greatest hits of all right. the contracts he did with the Vikings. It has a no trade clause in it. So he got all of this control, all of this guaranteed cash <laughs> that basically would suggest. They are committing to me. They're making me the guy for the rest of the decade or the rest of my career, at least. And he said that. I mean, I got the commitment I wanted. I, you know, everybody's on the same page. I mean, that quote got a lot of run. Um, and his wife is from there. His family's there. Yeah. Her, her wife, her family's there. His family is in Orlando, so he's closer that way. But now they make this pick, and they, in contrast to the Vikings, don't have this kind of clear sense of where the Falcons are going to go. And, you know, maybe some of the reason for that is they didn't want to get strafed on the pick and have somebody else come and, and take panics if they wanted him. But I think he looks at it and says, well, I thought I was escaping this in Minnesota. And if you were going to do this, why didn't I get some level of heads yeah. up? They don't have to do that, but no. it just it's going to make things awkward yeah. for a long time there, especially when you, like you said, have a 24-year-old quarterback that you're probably not going to wait that much longer to put on the field. So what so, ha- like very how mind like, boggling whole thing playing this out to like a a logical end like what how does this look after this year like he's got a no trade but he can't be terribly yeah. happy like what I, I don't know we'll get back to the Vikings in a minute this this whole thing was just the surprise of the draft and I still yes. I can't wrap my head around it other than Atlanta is trying to secure their quarterback future and they don't necessarily care that it's going to come at the expense of kind of burning a lot of Penix's rookie contract. They just want, they just liked him enough that they think he can be the guy for five or 10 years after cousins is gone. Yeah. I mean, we heard a lot of this, uh, you know, kind of around the time of the combine that there was all this chatter that Arthur Blank was sort of saying, I don't care what it costs. I just don't want to worry about the quarterback position anymore. Go get this done. Right. And they did. Um, they, they shouldn't have to worry about who their starting quarterback is going to be for a long time if both of these guys are are competent quarterbacks. Cousins, we know what he is, and Penix, we'll see. But, it, yeah, it feels like kind of a, well, all right, um, this is what the owner wanted, we'll do it. it. It felt like one of those types of scenarios where this may not make the most football sense, but you know, if the man in charge says, go do this, um, or I'll find somebody who will, it right. becomes a little difficult to do anything else. And that was kind of, and I don't know that for sure, but that's kind of my read on it, just looking at the situation and kind of looking at, it's an educated guess based on what we know. Um, so as for what happens from here, I think the only way out of it for him is, you know, do you try to trade him when Penix is ready? Will he wait his, wave his no trade clause? Um do they end up doing the Russell Wilson thing where they just eat a lot of dead money and cut him and he goes to play somewhere basically for free to that team? I, I don't know. I mean, there'll still be coaches that, I mean, he's, he's got the greatest Rolodex in the NFL in terms yeah. of the coaches played for half of them on that Mike Shanahan staff. But um, I don't know. I, the idea that he's going to ride off into the sunset and, you know, see his, in-laws every weekend and win Super Bowls and retire there or, you know, split time between there and Michigan or whatever it looks like this, you know, perfect end to his career. It, you can't say that at this point. So, no. I mean, all of the Kirk Cousins wanting to eliminate the uncertainty that he's gotten so used to, uh, guess what? It's yeah. right there again. It's, yeah. And it's going to be there for the foreseeable future, probably the rest of his career at this point. It seems like it. Um, it would have made more sense to a certain degree had Atlanta taken JJ McCarthy just because he's a little bit younger. You can imagine yeah. he might need a little yeah, bit more. The he might need a little more of a of a ramp, an on ramp to to play and you know, twenty twenty one versus twenty four. That said, what you know, I think you've written that the Vikings are going to be patient, of course. They're not going to rush anybody in. They're going to be like, they're he's going to play when they think he's ready to play. Yeah. What what do you think? You know, now we're heading into rookie mini camp this weekend. What would you imagine, either in your own mind or like in some sort of like you know, realistic internal timeline for the Vikings is kind of how they're tracking for here's when we think he could or should be ready to play. 
Well, I would say this. I don't think the question for them is, is he better in the horse race this summer than Sam Darnold? I don't okay. think we are looking at this from the, I don't think they are looking at this as saying, uh, you know, who who's QB one from this perspective. I, I think it's more about when is JJ McCarthy ready? And when have we seen everything from him that we need to see to say, this guy is ready right now to go be a top flight NFL quarterback. And if that doesn't happen, in week one, that's okay. It doesn't matter that he might be a little bit better than Sam Darnold, but not quite ready to ascend to that level of of excellence. I I don't think it's going to go that way. And again, maybe things maybe these things change. Maybe people feel pressure. I I don't think they're going to get pressure from ownership to play him early, but maybe they feel like you know we need to, need to put him on the field somehow or another. There's internal you know self inflicted pressure. I don't know, but. From what they have talked about and everything I've heard, I think they are going to be fairly meticulous and say, we want to see full evidence that it's managing huddle, it's footwork, it's route and, um, you know, defensive recognition, kind of finding spaces and coverage. It's um, putting touch on throws when you need to do that. That's a big thing yeah. that needs to work on is lo- learning to put touch on throws rather than trying to throw it through everybody and just kind of go hundred miles an hour on it all the time. So once that is all there, I, I don't think they'll hold him back, but I also think that's more of the threshold than, you know, who was the best quarterback in training camp. It, It very well could be that they say he was the best quarterback in training camp, but he's not ready to be, um, elite NFL starter level guy. And we're not gonna, rush that process because so much of this with young quarterbacks in, and they, they've looked at a lot of this is how easy it is to ruin them. I yeah. mean, yeah. they're in a bad situation, whether it's coaching, whether it's line protection, whether it's talent around them. And this is not a bad situation. I think everybody's talked about this. JJ McCarthy has said it and they have indicated that you know, they've, they've heard a lot of the same thing that all these quarterbacks wanted to be here because of the situation they're walking into. So, this may not be a problem, but Sam Darnold is an example of this. That yeah. you can draft a guy up near the top of the draft and think we've got our quarterback problem solved, and you get him in, and whether he doesn't click with the receivers or there's coaching changes, or a lot of times the protection isn't there. I mean, certainly you think about a guy like David Carr. Yeah, you know, that's a famous example of it. Mm-hmm. If the protection's not there and he's running for his life, he's not going to develop. So. I think there's a lot of sensitivity toward the possibility of ruining a young quarterback if you just rush the whole thing. I mean, you know, like the you think of the Tommy Boy scene with Chris Farley trying to make a sale, and you know he's trying to be gentle with it, and he ends up ruining it, and it gets torn torn to pieces. That's what they're trying to not do, and I think the diligence and the the methodical approach to it will be in the name of avoiding that, I think, as much as anything else. Chinatown, Jake. The other point here, just to wrap it up, is yeah. Kevin O'Connell's first quarterback room ever in the NFL yeah. was Josh McCown, who is now his quarterback coach. So Kevin O'Connell and Josh McCown both lived this. The other quarterback in that room, Johnny Manziel. Wow. So you want to talk about cautionary tales. Yeah. And Josh McCown was with Sam Darnold as well. Sam Darnold can tell his own story. There are a lot of cautionary tales that either people in the Vikings quarterback room have lived or been very, very close to as they've watched them play out. What about McCarthy makes him a specific fit for the Vikings? I think we, we read a lot about his skill set. We kind of know what he does well. He didn't have to you know, be a, a savior at Michigan. He was on a very good team. He could kind of be you know, third down efficiency was good, things like that. But like, what what's the match here specifically with what Kevin O'Connell likes to do? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is the throws he did make in college. There are a lot of Vikings concepts in Michigan's offense. I mean, the fact that it was a, a pro style offense, the fact that it was um, overseen by people that have coached in the NFL and Jim Harbaugh and people that coach again in the NFL and Jim Harbaugh. Um, I, I think that helps. I think it makes it easier to say, how will this map into 
what we do on our offense because we've seen him make these types of throws. I think they like his decision making. It's um, you know generally just not taking unnecessary chances with the ball. I mean, there's times where you see that show up where he's trying to make a play somewhere, and he's had a couple of interceptions. I think in in bigger games that he looks like he's just trying to free will a little too much. But I think it's being able to find space in coverage. I mean, I know they've I've, I've talked to people who've who've highlighted that just finding voids in secondaries and, and not always from the perspective of, well, okay, this safety is here. That must mean this is cover three. Uh, and these routes are what I go to. It, it's more just being able to feel space and um, areas of leverage in those coverages that he does really well. I, they, you see throws that he made in that vein at Michigan. And I think there's a lot of feeling that he can do a lot of those things. And you know, the the thing you hear about him too, I mean, everybody says this and people kind of can roll your eyes at it. I think to some degree with some validity because it's hard to prove it and it's kind of just a squishy concept, but they, you know, they talk about he wins everywhere he goes. Yeah. And that thing of I'm the guy and everybody knows I'm the guy and people have to rally around me and I have to be the one to galvanize this team. He doesn't seem to be afraid of that. And he seems to understand that that's part of the job. You know, that stuff matters to them. Again, yeah. how do you quantify it? I don't know, but I do know that matters to them. And I think it's part of what they saw in him, too. Royal Credit Union smart checking accounts offer no monthly fees and no minimum balance. Enjoy financial freedom when you open your Royal Credit Union smart checking account online at rcu.org slash go checking. Insured by NCUA. Dallas Turner, um, they totally remade their edge rushers, obviously, with yeah. with no Daniil Hunter, um, no Marcus Davenport, obviously. They've, they've kind of you know, re- reshuffled the deck there with the free agents they brought in, but also Dallas Turner. Like, they haven't picked an edge rusher that high in forever, right? Like, I, was ed- I think it was 2005, Erasmus James, since yep. they picked an edge rusher in the first round. Um, a little different scheme, obviously, you know, 3-4 outside linebacker, things like that, but what how, how do you think he and any of these other moves they've made you know off season wise whether it's you know signing and drafting some bigger corners some more physical kind of corners like how do you think this fits into what flores likes to do well i think you're going to have more depth in that group than they've had i mean last year it got to the point where you know daniel it's daniel hunter and then kind of who else and you're playing all of these guys for you know um 900 a thousand snaps a season and you would prefer not to have to do that because it means that they get a little bit worn out as we get into the 17th game of the season and if roger goodell gets his way eventually the 18th game right. of the season um which he will because he always of does course. that's where yeah. we're gonna go um he'll get his president's day super bowl um you know that's that's where this is gonna go so it does mean from positions like that you need more guys because Fatigue is going to be a factor. So I think that helps. And it also kind of plays into this Brian Flores. I want guys that can move around and walk around and play in different spots. And you don't know where people are coming from. And even if they're playing more man coverage, which I think they will this year, the idea of I want positionless players is not going away. I mean, yeah. th- this idea of I want people that can move around and do all these different things and you really never know who's coming from where and it makes it hard to decipher and then pressure gets there or you have to get rid of the ball underneath because you don't trust that you can hold it long enough to decipher it. These types of moves, I think, are aimed at building a pass rushing group that does more of those things. I, I think you're going to have guys that can play in a lot of different spots and and can kind of... Uh, form into different shapes of things, different contours of the defense. I, I think that's going to be a lot of what they try to do with this group. And, and Dallas Turner certainly has shown the ability to do some of that in Alabama. I think he'll be asked to do it here as well. Final thought, Ben. Um, we had one JJ drafted. The other JJ, um, Justin Jefferson, can't help but notice he didn't get traded during the draft. Yeah. Those are some of the more outlandish I mean- uh rumors that we saw leading up to the draft like oh what, what could they get for justin jefferson like uh you could get him to stay and catch 100 passes a year for the next 10 years if you just pay yeah. him um you get the sense of 
timing on that and how, you know, now that they've kind of taken care of some other business, when that might happen? Well, I, I think, I still think it's a win, not an if. Um, yeah. And I would think we're probably not that far away. I mean, okay. the, the two kind of deadlines I look at, and again, some of this is getting to the point where, because I mean, I do think they got very close last year. I, I think when that thing didn't get done, before the season, it surprised some people. I think there was a lot of optimism in the building heading into that week before the Buccaneers game that it was going to get done. And it was not that far away. I think some of it was this thing of, well, hey, we're two years away. We can kind of wait sure. rather than settling for this is 98% of what we want. I, okay. I think that changes now when you're a year away from free agency and when you're coming off a season where you miss as many games as Justin Jefferson sure. did, it, that does, I'm sure, register in the back of of his mind of, you know, I, the the guaranteed cash is hard. If somebody puts that in front of you on a piece of paper and said, "We will guarantee that we will give you this much with this many zeros," um, and that that has an effect on people. So, I think it gets done. Uh, the two dates I would look at are. You know, whether the earlier one would be mini camp is yeah. beginning of June. Okay. I can see it getting done before that so that there's not this question of, is he going to be there? Is he sure. not? Um, the other one would be before training camp starts right. in July. I would think that the target is get it done at the latest uh, at the start of training camp. I don't think you're wanting to play this out until no. beginning of the season again. I mean, they could, I suppose. There's nothing saying that they can't, but. I think this is now job one. I think the Vikings want it to get done. I think it will get done. I I think they're, the the picture is clearer now in terms of who the quarterback is, what they're gonna what they're gonna have financially for the next few years. Um, yeah, I, I think all of that sort of speeds it towards the conclusion here, which I would expect we'll see before I put it this way: before summer turns to fall or. Yeah, you know, yeah. Before you know, we get to the the beginning of the regular season. I, I think it'll be closer to off season stuff, okay. whether it's OTAs, training camp, than than it is the beginning of the year. Okay. Well, we'll see how it all plays out. Uh, we'll see if you are tweeting more about the Timberwolves Friday night, Ben. Um, a lot of people were. It was a it was a night. It was a night. And, yeah, uh, it sure was. Might have been. I, I think I wrote I wrote on Tuesday. In terms of pure joy, you might have to go back to the Minneapolis Miracle. Just in terms of yeah. like a moment where everyone was like, oh my God. And this was different. Like this is like, you know, they've been on this roll and then to take yeah. it a step further and just to blow out Denver in game two, like the the digs catch was just like a what just happened moment. Yeah. But in terms of pure joy, we don't get a lot of that around here. So it was nice to see. Yeah. I mean, just the sheer dominance of it yes. where it's yeah. just like a Minnesota team is Minnesota doing team. this, this yeah. in sure? this spot yeah. to this opponent. Yeah, there there just aren't a lot of um, other examples of that in in recent memory. Certainly, no. probably for any any of the younger listeners of this no. podcast, there aren't many no. of them at all. No. So we can remember a few, but not a ton. Not and a ton. Certainly not uh, anything in the last 10, 15 years or so. Well, we'll see where this is all playing out by the time we talk next. Ben, appreciate yeah. it. We'll talk to you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Really good stuff from Ben. I like the points that he made about how the Vikings won't put J.J. McCarthy out there um, if they don't think he's ready to be a top-level quarterback. Basically, it's not like a competition in training camp between him and Sam Darnold. If he's a little bit ahead of Sam Darnold, but they don't think he's ready to be the quarterback that they want him to be, they might let him get more of that time, study a little bit more, things like that. So I'm curious to see how that process plays out. I'm sure everybody else is too. I don't think they'll be swayed, you know, based on what we know of Kevin O'Connell and also what Ben said. They won't be swayed by historical context, but just for historical context, Teddy Bridgewater, the last Vikings quarterback to be selected in the first round of the draft. He was the last pick of the first round in 2014. He made his debut by week three of 2014 in relief of Matt Castle and then started week four. A great debut for Teddy that year. That, that uh, year, by the way, 19 of 30, 317 yards. Vikings won 41 to 28. So 
I would, exp- you know, that that's a pretty common timeline for a rookie quarterback to maybe not start the season right away, but to get in there pretty soon. But again, I don't think historical context will necessarily determine when we see J.J. McCarthy. Like Ben said, it will be determined by when he is ready to be the guy, not rush him, not ruin him like other first-round quarterbacks have been ruined. Let's finish with the cooler. A couple things quick. The Wild stayed put in the NHL draft lottery, staying at number 13. Not where you want to be necessarily, the kind of in that uh, that squishy space between not good enough to make the playoffs but not bad enough to get a really high draft pick. They've been in that spot before. Um, but 13, you know, we'll see what they get at 13. And a lot of these guys, of course, don't make immediate contributions anyway. The NHL, these guys generally need a lot more seasoning, minor leagues, overseas, college, things like that. So we will find out who they pick in a couple of months here. And WNBA, big story there. Uh, charter flights are going to start the season for all teams. This is something the league and its players have been fighting for for a long time. They've had to fly commercial for most of their travel last year and all of their travel in, you know, in years past. Now they'll be flying charters. Why is that important? Comfort recovery, things like that, and just the the professionalization of this league. It's a moment for this league. Revenues are going up. Attention is going up. I'm glad they were able to get this win, get this thing they've been fighting for, um, and get this uh, get this settled. So that will be part of the WNBA this year. They're basically saying as soon as they can get all the planes lined up, this will be a part of this season. That will do it for me today. Like I said, Chris Hine coming up on a show pretty soon here. Going to talk to Marcus Fuller, I think, about transfer portal, name, image, likeness, how it's impacting the Gophers men's basketball team. Thinking I'll have a Bally Sports North um, update as well, maybe even a special episode depending on what I can pull together. So listen for that as the week goes on. Until then, I am Michael Rand. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Back at it again tomorrow.